Uh, my name is Mike Lewis. I'm a professor at Emory University and the director of the Emory Marketing Analytics Center. I uh, want to wish you guys a, a, a great welcome to our spring webinar series. Uh, the Analytics Center's mission is really focused these days on the topic of intense consumer loyalty. And so what that really equates for us is a focus on fandom. And so what we do at the center is we emphasize the development of knowledge related to fandom. And as part of that, we like to bring you guys as much content as we can, uh, you know, people working in the space. And so we've got a, uh, you know, kind of a, a great situation today with Mr. Vince Thompson from Melt. Okay, so before we, as, as we get things a little bit ready, I'll tell you guys a little bit more about where we're going with, uh, where with the, we're going with the spring, uh, the spring webinar series. So today we've got Vince Thompson. On March 11th, we will have Jay Busby from Yahoo Sports. Uh, we chose March 11th as the anniversary of the date when sports essentially was shut down by COVID. So Jay's gonna come in and talk about sports in the, in the last year and also about the art of storytelling. Then on March 25th, we have Ann and Sid Mashburn, sort of local Atlanta legends in the fashion and retailing space. In particular, Ann and Sid have done a masterful, masterful job in terms of creating a brand and a customer experience. And so uh, again, a business that has really generated a lot of consumer passion and in fact fans, how they're dealing with the COVID 19 environment. Okay, so the format for today is, you know, we're going to kick things off pretty quickly here and move along to the main event, uh, Vince. And throughout the talk, uh, I want to encourage everyone out there, all the attendees, to submit questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the gentleman uh, with the fan fanalytics background behind him is Doug Battle. He is the communications and sports analytics uh, specialist for the Marketing Analytics Center. Doug will essentially collect the questions and deliver those to Vince in whatever time we've got left after Vince gets through his main message. Okay, so like I said, this is a, a great get for the center. You know, given our focus on consumer passion and fans, there's few folks in the Atlanta area that I think are sort of better able to speak to the topic from the marketing side of the equation. So Vince founded Melt um, in 2000 and built it into truly a remarkable agency. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check my notes here for just a second. Um, 20 years of representation for Coca-Cola Company, 17 consecutive Final Fours, seven consecutive seasons of ESPN get College Game Day, FIFA, MLB, Coach Nick Saban. So someone that is very much at the center of sports marketing in especially the Southeast region. Um, Vince is a local legend, uh, named by the Atlanta Business Chronicle as one of Georgia's 30 most influential people in sports business for 2020. Chief Marketer Magazine's uh, 2020 Top 200 Agencies. I don't want to. I don't want to sort of do this too briefly, but it's a long and epic list of accomplishments. How are you today, Vince? Hey, thank you so much. So, what I think we want to do today, because uh, Vin Vince has come in with a, a deck that's going to provide essentially a nice overview of what the agency does, some of the highlights of his career and getting to even where he's going to go next. So with this as a, a starting point, do uh, you guys want to share the screen? And, and at this point, let's just kick things off for Mr. Vince Thompson. Well, thank you so much uh, for that amazing introduction. Thank you so much <clears throat> for the opportunity. Uh, greetings and welcome to everybody. Um, you know, uh, it's always an honor uh, and a privilege to be able to talk to um, to folks, try to help people, uh, and uh, particularly during this period of time, always honored uh, to be a part of any program uh, at Emory. Uh, Javier Coisueta is one of my best friends and, and uh, advisors and uh, mentors, and so I know this institution is very special to him as well. And as you were mentioning, March 11th was um, 
was a day that, you know, you, you always remember where you were. Um, I'll never forget. I literally had taken my son to the Bahamas for his, to celebrate his 20th birthday, which was March the 10th. We landed on March the 11th. And uh, as soon as I landed, uh, my phone literally started just blowing up with cancellations of the SEC basketball tournament, March Madness in Limbo, um, Hangout Music Festival, PGA, Major League Baseball, MLS. Spring is the spring is when we make a lot of hay, and spring and summer, you know, in the event business, we produce about a thousand events a year. Um, and uh, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about silver linings and where I see things going uh, into the future. So um, the uh, the breakdown of the presentation will be in three parts. We'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we do. We've been very blessed. Um, you know, as you said, we've been uh, we now represented Coke 21 years uh, for all things sports marketing. We'll talk about that secret to the success as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about where I see these things going moving forward. Uh, and what I'm hearing in the marketplace. The great news is I'm starting to see some green shoots from uh, corporate America. I'm hearing some positive uh, things from green shoots, uh, the positive that, uh, that hopefully things are going to come back. We'll talk about some new opportunities that are going to be out there for everybody. And then I do encourage you to uh, submit uh, questions and answers. I really uh, love to help people. And we'll talk about my intern program a little bit where we're trying to help as many students as we can. If you want to follow me on social media, uh, at Vinny Inc., uh, hit me up or hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, we've got about 21,000 followers, which would is a great Rolodex and resource for you. Uh, if you're reaching out to people that I'm connected to, you can tell them that you heard me on this presentation um, you know, today. So big advocate of that. We'll talk about that in a little bit as well. My journey actually began in lower Alabama, the real L.A., a town of 800 people called Chatham with one traffic light. Uh, we could get to Gulf Shores and Orange Beach in less than two hours. I grew up fishing and um, basically, um, you know, I lived a, an idyllic lifestyle like Mayberry, Andy Griffin, if you guys have heard of that. And I was kind of like the Opie Taylor. My dad was the mayor and owned a grocery store, but that is the actual red light of where I grew up. And I loved sports and I um, loved to write about it. And so I had these dual passions. Um, and in the old days in Alabama, when you're growing up, the, your school selection process was, um, are you going to go to Auburn or, or Alabama? And my parents were like, well, you're going to go to Auburn. And I'm like, well, okay. Uh, unlike my, my son's a sophomore at the University of Georgia, and he went through this, you know, the arduous process, as you guys have done at the undergrad and graduate level. Uh, and um, you can uh, make fun of me if, if you want. My ACT score was 21. I don't think I could get in, um, I don't probably couldn't even get in high school now. Uh, but uh, so when I got to Auburn, it was a little bit of a culture shock for me. In that, it was the largest place that I had ever, uh, ever been. Um, Kyle, is, this, is that Skip? After that one? In the transition? I'm sorry. All right. All right. I'm sorry about that. So I get to Auburn and um, it was the biggest place that I'd ever been outside of um, going to a New Orleans Saints game or in the summer going to an Atlanta Braves game. So uh, suffice to say, I was in a little bit of a culture shock. I had never been around that many people. Uh, and I uh, immediately knew that it was a, I re immediately recognized that there was a, a um, sort of a caste system when I went. Loosely, I'll say the haves and the have-nots. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but I recognized pretty quick, I'm like, I'm going to have to outwork and outthink and outhustle these people um, if I, um, I want to get ahead in the world and I want to lay a vision for the things that I want to do. But I really just wanted to be a sports writer. It was the golden heyday of Bo Jackson and Charles Barkley. And um, so um, a chance encounter in my first journalism class, the sports information director talked about the press box and the sidelines in the locker room. And after class, I was like, man, that's where I want to be. And uh, that put me on a quixotic four-year journey, helped Bo Jackson win the Heisman. 
uh, had been published about 200 different times, had become very close friends with people like Paul Feinbaum and Dick Vitale and Brent Musburger. Uh, and so we'll talk about this a bit a little bit later, but where you are today, COVID notwithstanding, the campus and these great uh, professors and uh, who are giving you this labor of love and creating all these amazing programs is the ultimate professional laboratory. So, um, spent 15 years in Birmingham as a, sort of an apprentice, worked seven years for a great sports marketing agency, uh, was head of global marketing for Health South, which is a massive sports medicine company. And at 37 years old, I had outgrown Birmingham. I had a, nut, ta, nut, a, 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 a tug in my stomach to be an entrepreneur. I had a newborn and I said, well, I'm gonna go dive in the deep end. So I uh, moved to Atlanta and started Melt out of my home, which was founded around four driving pillars with the advent of the internet and, and not even social media, which stood for marketing, entertainment, lifestyle, and trends because I thought I could do it better than anybody else. So we've been very fortunate. Uh, you know, like I said, prior to COVID, we produced a thousand events a year at the highest levels. We were involved in activations for, you know, dang near everything that you see on television or you may attend as a fan. This is just a small snapshot uh, of the things that we work on, but you know, all the big rodeos, the food festivals, the wine festivals, the barbecue festivals, the music festivals, uh, sampling of huge products and, and working on college campuses across the country. And uh, we've been fortunate to have a 21 year relationship in the agency world with Coca-Cola Company, which allows us to, to have an insight and work with major, major, major organizations and sponsors, uh, unlike an agency, um, you know, our size. People say, what's the secret to maintaining this relationship? Uh, and it's called, uh, you never take it for granted. And that's true with any relationship in life. Never take the relationship for granted. Every day, it's like a plant or a flower. Cultivate it, nurture it, water it, groom it, trim it, fertilize it, give it light. Uh, and so we'll talk about those lessons learned a little bit later in the, in the, in the, in the uh, video cast. And we've been able to work with some of the biggest names in sports and entertainment. Coach Saban, LeBron James, James Harden, Coach Vitale, Cam Newton, Aron Sanchez, Game Day but the Jonas Brothers, but the main thing is, is that all of these people are just humans as well. So I try to find a commoner's touch when I'm dealing with them and make it relatable uh, and build that relationship as well. They have been all blessed with, with, with different breaks in life or different talents and things that they um, do really, really well. But at the end of the day, they all wanna be treated with a modicum of human kindness. So what's our sauce? It's, it's, it's gonna be like anything that you do to be successful. You gotta be nimble. You gotta be adaptable. You gotta be ahead of the curve and you gotta create your own movement. And this COVID and this pandemic, if you don't lose anybody that you love in this process, could be an amazing renaissance for all of your careers all of your entrepreneurship, particularly you who are the most sophisticated consumer, digital native in the world. And, and I'm bringing ideas to clients that a year ago, they would have thrown me out of the room and now they're like, hey, maybe that's not so crazy after all. So just like today, me teaching this class on a Zoom environment, there are no crazy ideas anymore because everybody's perception and how we do business all over the world has changed. I haven't been on an airplane since March the 11th. I don't miss it. Rarely do I wear a sports jacket, which is gonna be a, a giant challenge for Sid and Ann Mashburn. So um, the world has shifted and everybody goes, well, when is this going back to normal? I got news for you. There ain't no normal anymore, nor will it be in the foreseeable future. So it's impacted every aspect of our daily life. And I knew on a dime that we had to carve our path and drive effective positive change because let me note my industry got 100 percent devastated they're rarely fans at live events now and we'll talk about that in a little bit so one thing i wanted to do i've always had a hugely successful intern program 
We had 40 kids from 500 resumes because I lectured in college campuses across the country. I love to help kids. I've been very blessed and had guardian angels, but I always wanted to share it outside the walls of the agency. The other thing is I needed to keep a, po a positive forward face with the, with the industry and with my clients because our industry had been devastated. It would have been easy to get under the bed. And I might have binge drank a day or two, but then after I started feeling sorry for myself, I said, to hell with it. We got to get back up and, and, and get on the saddle. And I wanted to show the world that we were more than just an event marketing agency. So we took our program virtual. I'm now proud to tell you that we have a year round program, over 3000 students, even more than 37 universities of these kids. We, I just taped my 85th podcast on career development with top leaders in the world such as Jim Dinkins and Javier Goizueta, you can listen to that, you can get the advice, and then you can use that as an emotional networking tool to get to these people at a major level on LinkedIn, whereas you may not have had a warm intro or a warm lead. So we'll do another 100 of these. Uh, by the end of the year, we'll have over 150 to 180 in the can. We do a weekly career newsletter. I do a weekly sports business uh, called The Meltdown on YouTube. I've got my new book out, which is trying to help you guys land a job in a post-COVID era, because I'm going to tell you, in our space, it's going to be brutal because the unemployment is so high, you're going to have people who are willing to take um, a less job for a less salary, and it's going to depress the interlevel job market. So I'm going to give you some tips today on how you circumvent that. And again, overnight, this shifted. March 16th, March 11th, millions of dollars of revenue, thousands of live events, major, major emotional, financial, physical toll, the event business, the travel business, the restaurant business. Some industries have thrived. The car business has thrived. The home business has thrived. Um, but service organizations as a whole have taken a massive hit. However, when this comes back, it's going to create a major major opportunity for all of us. Two, two, two phrases. Change is inevitable. Growth is optional. Choose wisely. And in chaos, there is opportunity. Look at the financial hits the top four sports organizations have taken. And, 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 and by the way, because you got to understand that, that uh, live sports is still the greatest bet to make long term. But two of the primary revenue drivers of professional sports are the, uh, the fannies in the seats, the ticket revenue, the merch revenue, and the concession, concession revenue, and the sponsor revenue that the teams like the Hawks sell into State Farm when people are there becoming aware of their brand and sampling their brand. So um, you're going to see a massive movement in uh, investing in the investing world. You see these SPACs coming out, you see private equity coming in because they're getting that short-term cash to keep them propped up to get the other side of it. But we're gonna talk today about will fans come back and if and when they do, what are their expectations for those experiences? So you see, we're beginning to see some green shoots. Super Bowl had 22,500 fans, 7,500 were first line responders, uh, 30,000 cutouts. You could you know, uh, give $100, have your cutout in the, in the, in the, in the stand. Um, the colleges are, have been impacted uh, even a little bit harder and a little bit differently. They did have fans back, but their revenue losses from, you know, the television dollars kept them propped up, but sponsorship dollars, uh, attendance dollars, donor dollars, a lot of people were unemployed, it kind of cut those off. Um, We'll see what happens there. We're going to talk about some innovations that are going on into the, um, into the college sports because what the colleges now are understanding is that they're, they're in the real estate business as well. So you don't want Sanford Stadium sitting there 359 days a year empty. So what else can you do with this multi-million dollar structure to draw, to draw people and revenue? And then you see uh, the Hawks are still only operating at 10% capacity. 1,688 fans, and then all of these kind of, uh, you know, different things that you have to do. Do you take the test? Do you have your temperature, hand sanitary, prepackaged food, cashless, ticketless transaction, uh, efficiency, and liability? And let me tell you another thing about the event business. I carry 
$10 million worth of, uh, of insurance uh, liability. The companies make me do that. But in my insurance, there was no uh, interruption of business or force majeure that covered a, a pandemic or a virus. So I've been paying all these, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of dollars in, in insurance premiums, and I didn't get a penny back from uh, business interruption. So where do we go from here? In May, 57% of you said that you would not go to a game. I tend to think now, and I think, like I said, I'm hearing probably Labor Day is going to be the, it, it, you know, we're hoping the switch goes back in. I think the attitudes are different now. Vaccines, herd immunity, case counts, death counts, hospitalizations are going down. Um, I, I believe that we'll see some pretty positive trends um, in the fall during kickoff, college, pro, NBA, MLS, MLB. You're going to have a smattering of uh, fans at, uh, at Augusta in April. Uh, TV ratings were down across the board, but primarily because of the proliferation of the politics, uh, binge watching, and, and those types of things. But there are some, some positive trends that are going to continue to drive uh, eyeballs, whether they're in television or in your mobile device and in the cord cutting environment. So what's your journey? You may or may not have work or a job. So are you going to spend a thousand dollars to go to a Falcons game or a Hawks game? You may have been struggling with that even prior to the pandemic. Now you're like, well, I can take that same money buy me an 80 inch television for a thousand dollars, enjoy it in perpetuity, see a ton of games and, and all my favorite shows. I can sit home and be safe, not have some knucklehead give me COVID or stand up in front of me. Uh, and so you're gonna have fans really beginning to question the value of that, of that live and, and, and in-game entertainment experience. And so look for, the, look for the, the teams to try to add as much more value uh, to your experience to lure you back in there, whether it's high-speed internet access, surprise and delight, meet and greets, uh, you know, Arthur Blank does, you know, the $5 beer and food and all those types of things. Uh, and as I said, are we going to want to take the risk and want to take the hassle to go to a game where you can sit on the couch and, you know, see it in, you know, four, five, six, eight D. If you saw the Super Bowl on Sunday, they had – you can see these very clear images coming in on Mahomes and Brady. Those are those 4D cameras that really basically put you inside the huddle. Uh, so it's going to be fascinating to kind of see if that revenue, um, you know, ever, ever comes back because there were attendance weaknesses in pro and college sports, particularly in college, prior to COVID. What's next? We do love our tailgating. So what is that going to look like? We know that a lot of the tailgating is, uh, is attached to an emotional or a social occasion. Um, so I anticipate some of that coming back, or at least in the home gating environment. Um, we do know that, uh, that, 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 that the new cash coming into these sports franchises, so they're going to invest that money to try to get you guys there in a, in a safe environment and give you more value and the vaccine getting out there. Obviously, now you see where – um, these NFL and NBA stadiums uh, are testing sites and voting sites as well. But you probably will not ever see a, a hard ticket again. You probably will not see much cash in these venues. And you're going to see the food service um, evolve into a completely different um, uh, transaction and environment uh, now. And they're still testing a lot of that. And a lot, I think a lot of the vendors like Chick fil A may or may not. Uh, they may pass on these opportunities going forward because it's not a, an equal representation of their food the same way you would get it uh, in their restaurant or through the drive-thru. But as I said, in chaos, there's opportunity. Legal wagering is sweeping the U.S. Fantasy, sweeping the U.S. Uh, Top golf in Sanford Stadium, who'd have thought it? TikTok being a primary driver of a younger consumer into uh, a sporting environment. We saw, you know, um, Miley Cyrus, Lady Gaga, uh, NFL using TikTok to drive and even Nickelodeon to drive a newer consumer. It's not necessarily uh, people my age. Uh, it's people your age that everybody's trying to figure out. So that means that you control 
the purse, the pocketbook, and the narrative. So how is that going to change sponsorships? The television rights deals, you'll see the NFL hit $100 billion because live sports is still the only true place to galvanize a whole bunch of eyeballs that are TiVo-proof or Netflix-proof. And with your phone in Georgia, pretty soon you're going to be able to bet in-game with your friends what they call the prop bets. Um, producers like Craig Silver, my friend from CBS, produced, believe it or not, a lot of SEC football games from a studio in New Jersey. So um, we've got to find new ways to engage with the younger audience. Data analytics is a massive career. What do I mean by that? They need to know, first of all, it's the stats that power your knowledge of betting and fantasy. And then the second thing is um, we need to know and they need to know everything about your consumption habits to try to drive your eyeballs to watch it or bet or play fantasy or get your – Fanny in that seat. Uh, ESPN just doubled down on the SEC. They were already paying them $4 billion a year, another $3.5 billion for the exclusive rights uh, beginning in 2024. And new ways to acquire content. Obviously, if you chart the success of Barstool, it is a, um, it is a case study for you to study how Portnoy started you know, reviewing pizzas, then moved into edgy content, then drew around sports, then drew in a younger consumer, uh, and then rode the wagering wave where Penn National Gaming, uh, for a third of his business, paid him $163 million. So the future is bright. It's just being redefined in our space. So new growth, new opportunities, where are they? Um, we had a great interview on our podcast with Alan Green, new wave CEO of the of the Auburn Athletic Department. These aren't athletic directors, guys. These are chief executive officers of $150 million organizations. People don't realize that. So now we've got careers in venue and facility management, safety, security. You've got giant performance, physical health, nutrition, hydration, performance. Uh, mental health emerged as a big one. Content development, obviously, the whole world is driven by content. The press, the sponsorships, the data analytics, how these athletes train, uh, and their safety. So tons of new, new opportunities, concessions. How's that experience going to be delivered? Helping educate these kids. Data analytics and tickets are really, really, really big. So my traditional background of learning to be a sports writer and working in sports information was relevant to me building my business. But now you can have majors and undergrad and graduate that have absolutely nothing to do with with the quote unquote sports or communication or PR and have giant careers in this space and we haven't even gotten into the student athletes and name image and likeness and Thursday uh, I'm launching a new agency that are going to allow companies to take advantage of these student athletes and their families and bring billions of dollars of new revenue into uh, the pockets of college students and college athletes because now you can get paid for a YouTube video. My son can get paid, but uh, Trevor Lawrence, well, he can now, but prior to the CFP, he could not get paid, which is completely ludicrous in a multi-billion dollar industry. So uh, one of the things that I did in the spirit of silver linings, um, I wrote down everything I wanted to do when this thing hit the fan and everybody always thought that this would be over Memorial Day uh, flatten the curve and we'll be back in the summer. Well, wrong on that. We're going into our 12th month. So I decided to write a book called Bill Brand You, um, which talks about the importance of nurturing your own brand. Treat yourself as your own brand. It's going to be a slugfest out there in the market right now for your dream job. As we talked about uncovering these new industries, I want to show you some tricks of the trade in the resume and some tricks of the trade in the social and digital world. Your brand is your values and your reputation. And then the integration of all the tools, experience, the networking, the relationships, the portfolio, the resume, the LinkedIn. This is going to be a slog. It's going to be a process. It's going to be an audition. It is not an application process in the real world now. And gain experience. Yes, that's me on the right. 
hanging banners for ESPN when cable television was in 10 million in homes. But by the time I left Auburn, I had produced over a thousand events, had been published 200 times, and maintained relationships from 40 years with the fine bombs and the vitals of the world. So where you are right now is the most valuable time and fertile ground to build this long-term career path and career vision. The great campus of Emory is the ultimate professional lab. And it really doesn't matter what you do. If you're a barista, I want you to think about this. You're on the front lines of consumer behavior, serving hundreds of guests per year. You're not a coffee server. If you're a, uh, if you're a class assistant, if you're a student assistant, you're a lab assistant, what you're showing me as an employee is effort and initiative. I'm looking for the intangibles because look, I had a really bad grade point average except in journalism classes, but I had this massive portfolio that I knew I was gonna put myself in the 5% of the job hunt when I was out in the market and I did. And we talked about maintaining relationships. The first two letters of relationship are RE, and the first two letters of reciprocal are RE. They have to work both ways, guys. Get yourself some note cards. Track Vince Thompson down. Send me a note with your resume that says, hey, I really enjoyed that. I wanna stay in touch with you. I love what you have going on. Here's my resume. Keep me in the consideration process. As I said, it's fishing. You gotta make 500 casts to land eight bites to land two fish. It's gonna be a numbers game. But all these little small tricks of the trade, you're showing me what type of employee you're gonna be. And this sounds pretty rudimentary and you heard it a million times, but I call it the grandma test. If you don't want your grandma to see it, don't post it. The first thing I'm gonna do is check your social media profile. And by the way, you can have political opinions or whatever it is, and I don't have to agree with you. And I want you to show your authenticity, but what we're looking for in your postings is your judgment or lack thereof, because that is what we're gonna base our hiring decisions on. I call it an inverted pyramid to, to build your resume. One page, lead off with who you are and what you want to be. Show your initiative on college, whether it be experience, awards, or volunteer. I expect you to be highly educated. And, and, by, and by the way, here's the thing. A resume is like a blind date. You only have one chance to make a first impression. Or I call it the billboard test. It takes three to 10 seconds to pass a billboard on the, on the interstate. That's as much time as you've got to get a busy person's attention like myself. And I, you will be shocked that I will get a, a generic website, info at Melt, career at Melt, to whom it may concern, here's my resume, I need to make uh, how much money? You know the first thing I, and the last thing I do? I flush the dead gum thing. Because I'm very easy to find on the internet. And you're showing me the effort or lack thereof that, um, that you'll be showing as an employee. It's only as important as you make it. And you're showing the intangibles not the tangibles. LinkedIn, greatest professional tool on the planet, bar none. As I said, I'm launching a new agency for student athletes called Sunil, student athlete NIL, name, image, and likeness. It's gonna bring new corporations billions of dollars into sports. I am just like you. I have sent 500 inquiries out through LinkedIn Leveraging mutual connections is what I call the warm lead, the ego league, or the emotional connection, which is low-hanging fruit. Hey, uh, I heard Vince Thompson on, uh, on the Emory podcast. Uh, I know you're linked into him. I would like the opportunity to link in with you. Know your target. Know Vince Thompson. Show the intangible. Soften me up. Hey, Mr. Thompson, congrats on your success. Congrats with Coca-Cola. Congrats on your uh, award, uh, War Eagle. You're really just showing me, you're softening the target. You're showing me that you put the effort in to research and study who I am, which is making an intangible impression on me. So I might accept your LinkedIn and I might begin a dialogue. 
And, and by the way, in this virtual process, and these rules apply um, whether you're in the office or, or, or on virtual, um, but you got to bring the heat. Turn the damn phone off. Don't have dogs barking. Be in a professionally backed room, dress professionally, make this eye contact, know your subject matter, invert the process, interview the interviewer. It's the intangible things. It's a process. It's an audition. It's a blind date. It's not an application. And it's going to be 50 to 500 times harder now to make those impressions. But every executive is sitting in their home in a virtual environment. So you actually have more opportunities than trying to get somebody on the phone, in a meeting, 12 hours a day at the Coke building or whatever. So you actually have more and better opportunities to do this now. And by the way, people say, Vince, what business are you in? I go, I'm in the rejection business. I get told no 99 out of 100 times, but I am absolutely relentless. Remember these two words, the letters N-O do not spell no. They, study, they spell the, the two words of not yet. And I'm doing the same thing that you're doing just at a different level, but I am absolutely relentless in my pursuit of new business and building businesses. What's on the horizon? Legal wagering is a monster. Esports is a monster. Even EA football is back. Um, the video games, which are tied in, Twitch is a monster. As we talked about, NIL is a monster. Where are these new revenues going to come? Fantasy sports is a monster as well. So. Again, this is the glory days of opportunity in the sports and entertainment and culinary industries. Rules to live by, just outwork people. Accept anything. I see a malady in the younger generation before COVID is that you thought you'd be CEO after three months. Don't happen, guys. You know, I'd hire somebody and pay them, you know, 60, 70, $80,000 a year. And in three months, they wanted to be the CEO, and then they were pissed. They weren't, and they left. And then I got to reinvest in time, money, energy, effort, replacement, retention. Uh, take time to do an old-timey thank you. You'd be shocked how far that goes. Think about building your own personal brand. What do you stand for? Uh, who do you admire? Uh, is it Tim Cook at Apple, LeBron James? You know, what companies, what, what people? Try to tailor your own brand. Show that initiative. Again, work the Hades out of LinkedIn. You know how to do the resume now. You know what to do on social media. You know to bring the heat. You see my passion. You may or may not even like what I have to say, but you see my passion and energy in this. Be prepared. And whatever your passion is right now is the time uh, to do it and leverage that emotional low-hanging fruit when you're reaching out to a lot of crazy, busy executives. So that's it, guys. Uh, I hope I've helped, and I am here to answer as many questions as you might have. Uh, before we uh, before we switch over, we'll give Doug a chance to uh, to uh, construct a logical order to the questions from the audience, and also an uh, an opportunity for the audience to put a, anything else they want out there in the Q and A. Vince, I want to thank you. That was uh, that was uh, phenomenal. You. I, you know, as I'm listening to you, I, I love the way you started. Some of the, some of what you mentioned really kind of touched me and sort of put off, you know, sort of alarm bells going on. Uh, like the way you integrated from, you know, your, your journey getting to Auburn. And the first thing that really kind of I, I noticed and made a note of mentally was the fact that you had Bo Jackson and Charles Barkley on campus at that moment. And, you know, it's hard for me to not ask the question of, you know, how does that cha fundamentally change your experience at Auburn University when you've got guys like that that are, you know, creating legends while you're in, you know, on, the, on that campus? Uh, and, 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 uh, and I'll tell you this, too. Um, we had Rowdy Gaines, who won about 500 gold medals in swimming. We had Harvey Glantz, the fastest man in the world. We have Bill Kazmaier, the strongest man in the world. Um, I immediately recognized a couple of things because the arrival of Bo and Charles to Auburn, Auburn at that time was at a very low point. And I saw the power of sports and performance um, that could restore a massive brand and a massive organization like Auburn University because it was an emotionally galvanizing um, uh, time. And I said to myself, 
I'll be, I'll, I'll have a job the rest of my life because sports has that impact. And it really has it now because of, you know, in a period of, of COVID and civil unrest and political turmoil and all that, we still can come together and watch a game with our buddies and, and have debates as Tom Brady or Patrick Mahomes, the GOAT and the Prince of all time. Uh, so I think the uh, emotional impact that I saw some of the greatest in the world have, even when they were 18, 19, 20 years old, really made a massive impact on me. Yeah, and, and, and look, as a professor, I love what you're saying, because uh, th this idea that sports creates arousal, gets people excited, that that fundamentally changes how receptive they are to, you know, the other brands that are involved. Right. Okay, so Doug, what is the audience asking? Yeah, I'm gonna go through these, um, as many of these as we can. I'm sure we may have more questions pop up than we're able to hit, but we'll, we'll do the best we can. Uh, first one is from Tom. He says, how was engagement tracked and recorded for FY 2020, assuming that's fiscal year 2020? Uh, what started as a normal year turned to an unprecedented cancellation of all professional sports but upon its return was greeted with even more excited fans and populations using their TVs and streaming services more than ever before. So again, the question is, how was engagement tracked and recorded during that time? Well, I, 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 we, a lot of us turned to um, a lot of traditional and non-traditional now digital and social analytics tools. So, um, so we would track um, the conversation and participation flow uh, if we knew fans were saying watching the, Fa for instance, the Falcons versus the Eagles. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, you know, we tracked a lot of uh, participation with, um, within FanDuel and DraftKings because you started seeing a lot of uh, betting and wagering activity and fantasy activity uh, as well. And we, we saw some pretty serious upticks in that because people were uh, gathered in their homes, communicating on their second screen and third screen devices with their friends who may not be gathered with them. So they had, uh, you know, basically a virtual uh, social and emotional gathering. So it was in a social and digital environment. It was in, you know, four or five of the traditional social media platforms. Then it was in the fantasy platforms and the wagering platforms and, you know, FanDuel and, and DraftKings and BetMGM and, and, and some of those kind of things. And I could argue that um, it probably brought more casual fans into those franchises a heck of a lot earlier in, in their in their in their fan journey than they would have because you didn't have anything else to do. So, like you know, I wanted to, to bond with my 20-year-old son who was over at Georgia in the Sigma New uh, you know Sigma New house. Um, you know, we would pick three or four games to wager on during the weekend and that gave us a conversational and watching platform even though we couldn't come together and he was in Athens and I was in Atlanta um, you know we'd bet on a couple games on Saturday bet on a couple games on Sunday uh, and then settle up during the weekend and then during the games we were you know going up and down emotionally as it was happening so um, a lot uh, you know it it but he and I probably never would have done that in a pre-COVID environment. I would have been over there, we'd have been at a game, or I would have been working an event. But so um, I think people saw it as a trial for a lot of emotional bonding. Great, well, um, thank you for, for answering that one. And next up, so we've talked about the University of Georgia, we've talked about Auburn University. Many of our listeners or, or viewers are at Emory, uh, where collegiate sports are not at the same level or, or the focus of national attention really ever. Uh, what do you suggest someone can do to stand out to enter the world of sports management coming from Emory University? Well, I, um, here's the thing. First of all, Emory is one of the most modern universities and brands in the world. So you, you've got that going for you. The second thing is, as I think I pointed out, find out where these new areas are. I mean, you've got one of the greatest you know, this program, for instance, one of the greatest business schools in the world and, 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 and tons of other amazing schools. But as I pointed out, there are so many quote unquote non-sports related sports jobs emerging now that, and, and if you go back and listen to some of the podcasts from actually some of the pro teams that I've, that I've interviewed with, um, they don't even want, like I had to see, I had the chief information officer of the NFL on last week, Michelle McKenna, 
she's not hiring anybody that has a sports background. Engineering, coding, I mean, analytics, accounting, stats. I mean, it's insane. So there are so many degrees available on Emory right now, particularly with your brand, that are so relevant to the entire sports and collegiate, pro sports and collegiate sports world right now that have nothing to do with sports. I think you're actually in a better place. All right. Um, well, let's see. Next up, we got Terry Brown asking, in the same way as entertainment has had to reinvent live experiences, what can corporations learn to reinvent their events or conferences? Oh, that's a great question. Um, we are, and, and, and by the way, there, there's, nobody's found the answer right now. I mean, maybe Pepsi with the, with the you know, sponsorship of the halftime show this weekend, with the weekend, but they still didn't really have a full line integration on it. Probably the best one that's done it is Amazon Web Services because they're, they're showing a relevance to the data and the cloud and the data management and the info that goes into AWS. Microsoft, when you're, you're seeing them look at those tablets on the sidelines and those types of things. So most consumer packaged companies, goods right now, um, are challenging themselves, challenging the traditional sponsorship model. How do we integrate with the fans? So I'll give you an example, one thing that we tested with Coca-Cola. So if you were uh, uh, in your um, home with your buddy and um, you wanted to watch the Falcons, but you didn't want to go down there, you could go on the Falcon site and say, well, I want a home and Fitch hamburger uh, with an ice cold Coca-Cola delivered to my condo with some fun Falcon swag popped in there so I could watch the game as if I were in the stadium, enjoying that stadium food with an ice cold Coca-Cola and then Coca-Cola with their sponsorships, puts a fun cup in there, surprise and delight, coupons to drive you to, you know, use Uber Eats or DoorDash or Grubhub again or Postmates or something like that. So, really having to rethink everything. And, and the, one of the hardest things, most, most corporate marketers are in the prevention, sales prevention business, risk, the risk averse business, they're playing not to lose. It's fun to see them all being pushed out of their comfort zones now because I, I bring these ideas in them to them for years and they're like, no, we'll just pour cup, Coke in a cup at the stadium and watch it with a, with a hot dog or a Budweiser and a beer. And those days are over. Yeah. Um, well, the, the days of college athletes not being able to benefit from their own name, image, and likeness uh, seem to be over or moving in that direction. So with the advent of student athlete licensing rights, how do you think companies will approach collaborating with college athletes as opposed to professional athletes? Do you think the process will be the same or are there different considerations at play? No, I think it's massively going to be differently because mm -hmm. I think the, the point and price of entry is going to be a lot lower. Okay. Uh, I think um, uh, I'm a big, I, I think that name, image, and likeness is going to save Olympic sports and non-revenue sports and be a, a boost for female sports and division two, II, three and HBCU sports. Let me give you an example, relevant example I had yesterday. I was on the phone with a major CPG company, multi-billion dollar company, never spent a penny investing in college athletics. They make, um, female products. And I said, I can deliver 200,000 female student athletes who are on television four hours a week, who have an average of 10,000 followers per and their moms. And you want to launch a new product with this for a fraction of what it cost would have cost to have bought a Super Bowl ad to reach a 55 year old white male. The lady said, where do I sign up? I've never had those types of conversations. So my goal is to put money in these, uh, because you got to understand when they say non-revenue, um, these, these, uh, girls on the Auburn women's equestrian team or Georgia team or Emory team, they're paying their own way through and they practice as hard as the football or basketball team or, or whatever. And so if I can put money in their pockets, five or $10,000 is a major impact. And, uh, and also help preserve these sports that are being cut out under the, under the guys that, uh, we're going to use COVID because our athletic departments have been hit. All the while, Auburn just unveiled a $91 million facility and a $21 million buyout of Gus Malzahn to basically fail. Right. Uh, the whole damn thing is backwards and upside down. So um, I'm looking forward to disrupting the whole process, if you can't tell.
<laughs> I can certainly tell. Um, so along the lines of college sports, with recent events like the UNC basketball game being canceled due to players partying and, and being unsafe about COVID, uh, is it harder to work in sports marketing when you now have to rely on the team and the players in an entirely new way? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a lot harder. <laughs> but because let me just tell you, people can deal with bad certainty and good certainty. They can't deal with uncertainty. So, so it's so like, like I said, corporate marketers are skittish by, uh, by trade. So, you know, you got a lot of people that have uh, billions of dollars in sponsorship dollars of people who have tapped the brakes during this process. And then sometimes they're afraid to advertise because they don't know how or what to say because they may alienate and offend half their audience. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but again, I'm very bullish because in chaos there's opportunity because the old ways and the old normal those days are over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you, you spoke a lot about networking and staying connected to your network. I know you talked about some of the guys you knew even from your college days that you've managed to stay in touch with over the years. What ways have you stayed connected to your network remotely given you can no longer see them in person uh, to nurture those relationships in this last year? It's actually easier because yeah. like, like, like things like this, I mean, you know, we may have may been able to work it out where I could come down to Emory or, 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 you know, spread it to as many people as possible. I mean, here's another business strategy I did with my podcast. I was using it as an excuse to reach out to a CEO and I knew that he couldn't tell me no to help thousands of kids, but it was also a way for me to stay in touch with him and pitch the new business ventures I was doing in the pre-record before the podcast. So, so you got to be creative in how you think now. But to me, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's a hell of a lot easier because you know everybody's sitting in front of their computers 12 hours a day. And uh, you'd be shocked at the responses I get through, um, you know, through LinkedIn. And people are like, wow, that's a great idea. I'll stay in touch with you. Okay, what's your email? Okay, send me an email. Okay, will you be on my podcast? Oh, by the way, I'm starting this business for student athletes and you know, you can, you know, use a hundred thousand of them uh, to get a new, you know, uh, a product offering out or new car. And I would have never, ever had this traction in the old world. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Well, one, one thing I saw last week uh, during the Super Bowl that we probably wouldn't have seen in the old world was Nickelodeon uh, interacting with the NFL through some kind of VR lens. Do you think the NFL's deal with Nickelodeon will lead to other major sports leagues um, airing yeah. their games on kids' channels to, to appeal to those younger? Because, because of the biggest dilemma is continuing to bring your generation of consumer into these franchises. Right. The average age of the viewer of March Madness is a 55-year-old white. <laughs> yeah, that's my. And that is not a coveted consumer target. You are the coveted consumer target because they're trying to to bring you into the franchise and build brand love for life and make you a fifty year consumer through your multiple life stages and life cycles. Gotcha. Well, uh, what one question we got here is uh, in regards to your podcast and and how you've gained listenership. What was your podcast marketing strategy? I'm going to be honest with you. Um, it's a grind. I mean, you don't, unless you're like Lady Gaga or LeBron, you just don't wake up with some massive audience. Mm -hmm. The key is consistency and relevancy. So I, you couldn't just put something out there and expect somebody to glom onto it immediately. So, um, you know, Kyle and my team have developed a cadence where we, we have uh, two per week. So you're conditioned to know one's coming out on Tuesday and one's coming out on Thursday. You're conditioned to know that our uh, meltdown video comes out on Thursday and you're conditioned to know our newsletter comes out on, uh, on that Friday. So we had a constant cadence, consistency, showing passion, showing relevance, showing really, really good guests that would resonate with a young consumer or their parents saying, you know, hey, Vince, you need to listen because there's the president of ESPN on. And then we always encourage the kids to reach out to the president of ESPN on LinkedIn and say, hey, by the way, I just heard your podcast with Vince Thompson. Great job. Fascinated with your history. Uh, I'd love to establish a connection with you. So also it was a part of a virtual networking strategy on behalf of these kids, but also a way for excuse for me to communicate with the CEOs and CMOs 
And as I said, goodwill is good business to keep a positive, consistent face out there in an industry that had been devastated. So <laughs> right. I had to stay relevant as well. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of staying relevant, uh, one of our listeners or, or audience members has said, you managed to pivot a lot in your business or a lot of your business. What is still eluding you in a problem you're still trying to solve? Managing an agency in a virtual environment is hard because mm -hmm. we're creative and ideas and energy and we, you know, hallway and interaction and throwing basketballs off the wall and late night pizzas. Um, it's hard in our world and it's hard in everybody's world as well, because there's still nothing that can replace being in rooms together and having energy and having eye contact and having a beer together or having a Coke together or bouncing ideas off that spontaneity has sort of been stripped out. Um, and so I think that's been one of the biggest challenges that uh, is really actually trying to run uh, a service driven virtual, virtual agency. And, and then you don't know, it's hard to keep people motivated in a virtual world eight hours a day. And then you don't know how everybody sort of handled being at home with their kids or family homeschooling, being solitary or their parents sick. I mean, it's, it's, um, I've seen a lot of interesting behavior, good and bad during this pandemic by running, you know, virtual businesses. Mike, how are we doing on time? We're good. How many questions you got? I got two more. Um, yeah, sounds good. Let's do okay, it. Great. Just want to make sure. Okay. So other than ways to attract more viewership and increase the lifetime value of your customers, what are some applications of data analytics in the sports industry in terms of attracting more viewership and popularity um, even outside of the United States. Say that again. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to just, I'm going to give that last part. So what are some applications of data analytics in the sports industry in terms of attracting more viewership and popularity outside of the United States? Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, uh, European soccer is massive mm -hmm. in this country. So I think, but, but I, I think the, I think the main thing is, is what value are you bringing to that consumer consuming uh, that content, whether it's on a television or a, or a, a computer or a, a wireless device. And, and I think what you've seen uh, is you've seen ingenuity and quality of the production. Like I talked about those 8k cameras that were over my home shoulder, Brady. So, right. So the quality of it, um, putting you in the huddle or putting you in the pitch or putting you in the net, I think, I think the quality of the production and then are there ways as a sponsor that you could serve up, um, you know, some added value to the equation. So like um, Rocket Mortgage had these chances to win a million dollars and 250000 and, and 10000 Now you know the odds are very great that you won't win, but you're like – you know, hey, what the heck, I might win, but then Rocket is gathering your data. They know you've been there. You, they know you've engaged. They know you're maybe an interesting consumer, and then they're going to continue to serve up core Rocket mortgage offerings. But then they may say, hey, we see you're Kansas City Chiefs fans. If you enter this contest, you, got to, you get to win a meet and greet with uh, Patrick Mahomes in an autographed jersey. So it's the quality of the production and the quality – uh, of the engagement that is going to keep consumers coming back and the quality of the, of the competition. Uh, but you know, interesting in this environment, there's really no home field advantage anymore. Mm -hmm. Think about going to Seattle and the 12th man and all that, and <laughs> all this piped in stadium music. And I went to um, the Auburn Georgia game. I went to the Alabama right. uh, Georgia game. I went to Alabama Florida SEC game. Uh, and it's just bizarre to be there. Yeah. Uh, but it was all, and, and I think, I think, uh, the NFL did a good job of the, uh, of the end game. I thought the, um, the college football did a good job. NBA is a lot harder to replicate smaller arena, you know, the distance between, you know, all that. Uh, I think MLB did pretty good. Um, but I think everybody had their druthers. Um, they won't, they won't fans back in the stands. Yeah, absolutely. People have been talking about, uh, Tom Brady, going on the road in the NFC to win the Super Bowl. And uh, you start to wonder if that would have happened in a uh, traditional environment. I, you where know, there's no way it would have. 
Yeah. I mean, you're in the Superdome. You can't hear in there. Yeah. You're in Lambo. I mean, it's intimidating. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, but it was interesting to see how that factored into the uh, the wagering in the betting industry without the home field advantage as, as, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Last question. We're right at 2 PM here. Uh, what was the process of working with Coca-Cola while one of their major partners, FIFA, was embroiled in a, a corruption scandal. I remember uh, this person is saying they remember Coke came out and criticized FIFA, uh, but it'd be interesting to hear what, you know, what it was like uh, to, to be working on Coke's behalf of that. Well, the thing about any of the brands is that, you know, um, so, because don't forget this, and I tell this to people all the time, forget the TV rights fees and all this kind of stuff. Sports doesn't exist without the sponsor dollar. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones buying the Super Bowl ads that fund the rights fees to secure the rights to televise. It. So they possess a very loud voice in here. Secondly, uh, so they want to always protect the integrity of their shareholder, particularly their public, and the integrity of their consumer. So they're always going to side with those two constituencies over the property. And, it, and it's really a, a, a no-lose, fail-safe strategy. Yeah. You know, and it is their fiduciary, you know, duty uh, as well. So, um, um, and I think now, you know, there's so much sunlight and transparency and in, in so many of these things that was not there. And I just had lunch today with the head of PR for NBC Sports. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, uh, the Tokyo games. And then, you know, then the next year you're going to have these games in Beijing and China and all that. And, I mean, just, just crazy debates that you may not have had even 10 years ago without, you know, the social media and the empowerment of the fans to, to have a say so. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, Mike, I'll let you wrap it up here. Vince, appreciate your time answering these questions. Hey, so Vince, well. this, this is one of these uh, moments in the online world where we kind of lack this ability to give you this warm round of applause, <laughs> but definitely it's there in spirit. Um, you know, I think throughout the day, you've really emphasized, uh, you know, you, your willingness and even eagerness to reach out and connect with uh, the students and the other uh, Emory alumni and the general public watching it. So absolutely, I, I think, is it safe to say you encourage these guys to all reach out to you on LinkedIn? Hit me up. It's my, it's my favorite thing because like I said, I've been very blessed. I had guardian angels, but I've also had to crash through 9 million doors. So if I can help open one door for somebody that, that leads to a, a job or a career opportunity or, or whatever, then, you know, it was a good day for me. And so, okay, so I, I like to be a servant leader in this capacity. So absolutely, folks, you know, encourage you guys all to reach out to Vince. Thank you a ton for the content. Uh, for everyone else, you know, continue to uh, stay engaged with us. Like I said, we got Jay Busby in about a month and in Sid Mashburn two weeks after that. It's going to be, uh, you know, Vince, awesome start to the webinar series. And then the other thing is how do we actually end these? It's like go in peace. Hello. <laughs>